So just a brief overview of what RAS is. It's a service that provides free legal and technical advice to Canterbury homeowners. We've been up and running since 2013 and we, our funding is guaranteed until at least April of next year. We're funded by private insurers, EQC, the Insurance Council and the Christchurch City Council, but the legal side of RAS is carried out by Community Law Canterbury and our solicitors have a duty to um, comply with our professional rules, including the duty to act in our client's best interests. So therefore, um, we act independently for our clients um, when we're working for them. I'd just like to draw your attention to the fact that the PowerPoints that you see on the board are available in paper copy if you want to take them home with you tonight, as well as that there's an MB booklet, Repairing and Rebuilding multi-unit residential buildings. It has some valuable information. Copies of those are at the back of the room as well and you're free to take one if that is relevant for you. So um, on to the topic, navigating your way through multi-unit dwelling earthquake claims. And we're going to look at the things that are um, similar to other earthquake claims, the things that are different. But first, let's just have a think about what we mean by multi-unit developments. So a multi-unit development is a development where um, land has more than one house on it and there are several different owners of the land and houses. So every parcel or piece of land in New Zealand is recorded on its own certificate of title and registered by Land and Information New Zealand or LINS in the database. There are various types of certificates of titles and it is the type of title held that dictates an owner's ownership rights and how their insurance claim will be handled. In a multi-unit development, the owners can have differing ideas on how the insurance claim or claims for the houses of land should be settled, but they will have to find common ground in order to reach the settlement of their claim or claims. And our experience is that generally that's where the problems arise. Either um, owners are unable to agree on particular matters, or you might have some owners who are absentee owners and can't be contacted, or you might have situations where there are communication issues or relationship issues. So those can act as barriers to be able to resolve earthquake claims. So the first thing to look at is what sort of ownership that you have. So there are different types of ownership rights. The two main types are cross leases and unit titles. So when you purchased your home, you would have been sent a copy of the title to the property by your lawyer and that will say which kind of title you own. But you could also ask your lawyer for a copy of this. Um, so let's have a look at how a cross lease operates. Cross lease title means that all the land in the title is owned by all of the owners of houses on the land. So there are various areas of the land which are then leased by the owners to each other when this is recorded on the title along with the lease document. So there's normally a peppercorn rent, usually a dollar per annum. Most cross lease flats are not stacked on top of, it, of each other, but they're separated from each other by a firewall, but not always. And it's possible for some of the units to be freestanding. So um, let's look at an example here. And it's, sorry, that it's difficult to see the detail there due to size. But on this one, there are four flats on the land, and this type is for flat three. So under this flat plan, each owner owns a quarter share of the total land, and the owner of flat three is entitled to exclusive use of the area marked land with flat three, which includes um, the area on which the house is built, an area outside, and garage three. Um, the common areas, including the driveway, may be used by all of the owners. So the lease document, which is signed by all the parties, contains the obligations and benefits of each of the four owners. Leases usually provide that owners may enjoy exclusive use of the various areas allocated to them, that they be responsible for maintaining those areas, including paying all of their outgoings. All owners have to insure their house, and they are all jointly responsible for maintenance and repair of the common areas. There is also usually a dispute resolution clause, um, and often disputes are resolved by way of arbitration, which can be reasonably expensive way of obtaining a remedy. 
Um, but the important thing to note is that all lease documents are different. The terms differ from lease to lease, and so it's worth carefully reviewing what clauses each lease document has, and it may be necessary to take uh, legal advice on what they say and also what they mean. Um, moving on to what a unit title is. So a unit title is usually units stacked on top of each other. There could be as few as two units or as many as 200. So um, they, these apply to developments built after 1991 when the Resource Management Act was introduced. And um, before then, usually cross these titles were used because it enabled some regulatory requirements to be avoided. Um, but now that loophole has been closed down, and most um, multi-unit developments since 1991 are unit title developments. Um, so just having a look at a plan of a unit title. So under this plan, all the owners own their own individual units, but the common areas are owned by all the owners jointly according to the unit entitlement. And that is calculated by the survey at the time the plan is prepared and recorded on the plan. So on this plan, all of the ownership interests are roughly equal in size and each owner owns approximately 6.6 .6 of the total area of the common areas. Um, so now we're going to look at how these claims are similar to other earthquake claims. So um, the settlement entitlements under multi-unit developments are the same. So if um, damage is $100,000 or less plus GST, then it's going to be dealt with by EQC. And EQC's obligations to homeowners are determined by the relevant provisions of the Earthquake Commission Act. If it's an overcap claim, so more than $100,000, then the claim will be transferred to the private insurer and it will be determined by the relevant insurance policy. Now, in a body corporate setup, it's more likely to be a single insurance policy, and the body corporate is the party to that policy, whereas with cross-lease developments, there could be a number of insurance policies that apply and a number of insurers, and so things can get quite complicated. Um, and so how these claims differ from ordinary standalone claims is really um, that the pathway for resolving them may be different and may be more protracted. Um, so the thing is, is that in a fee simple development where there's a single owner, then um, it's much more simpler, but in a multi-unit development, one owner will just have one voice and the other owners in the development will also have their voices that can also be heard. Um, and the, all of the voices need to be accounted for and considered when making decisions in, on the path to reaching a satisfactory settlement. So this means that all of the owners need to be working together and will not be able to settle, settle their claim without consultation or consideration of their neighbours' positions. Um, so what I'm going to do now is just to go through um, some more information to do with cross-leases and how claims might be resolved under cross-leases. So this is the situation where there could be more than one insurance company. Um, but sometimes uh, the claims, individual claims, can't be settled because owners will have an interest in the maintenance and repair of the common areas. And um, the council will only look at the repair or rebuild of individual units as part of the whole of the buildings on the land when they're considering whether or not to grant a building consent. So this really comes to the fore where there are shared building elements, such as shared foundations, shared firewalls, and a shared roof. And these requirements to treat the building as a whole is also reflected in the MB guidance document when engineers are assessing the damage. Therefore, a coordinated approach to resolution of insurance claims will be needed. Um, so insurers on this point have set up the shared property program and under the program usually um, there's a lead insurer who is appointed and the other insurers make financial contributions to the lead insurer and the lead insurer will coordinate the repair or the rebuild <coughs> of the units. Um, 
So it's going to be important in that situation for all of the owners to work closely with the lead insurer and to reach a settlement which reflects everyone's interests. Um, each situation is different and each situation will <coughs> depend on the terms of the lease document. So all owners should become very familiar with that document and take legal advice on it. Um, so some leases will say that an owner is obliged to reinstate all earthquake damage, whereas others may provide that cash settlement is acceptable. Um, if a rebuild is a method of settlement, then the owners will have to ensure any new home remains within the original footprint of the home, because otherwise a new plan will have to be drawn up. And when a new plan is drawn up for a cross-lease development, that does require application for resource consent, which can be a timely and costly process to go through. Um, in addition, the consent of any mortgagee or any financially interested party will also be necessary. So um, while the settlement of the earthquake claim is similar to a feasible house, the pathway can be significantly more complex. And I'll just hand over to Victoria to speak about how this applies to unit title developments. So, um, by the end of the 1960s, larger developments were being built, um, high rises, and there was a recognition that the cross lease situation and the, or the ownership structures that existed at that time weren't actually going to work um, for the number of potential owners um, involved. And so, the Unit Titles Act was introduced in 1972. And it's been um, amended and revised since then to bring it up to date and ensure that it now caters to um, body corporates which are, or unit titles which are very prevalent. Um, so unlike cross leases, with, um, or cross leases are dependent on the informal, or the, dependent on leases, but they usually run in a un very informal manner. But, um, Unit titles have strict statutory rules away the complex must be managed. Some aren't, and that's where they can come, or they can get into difficulty. Um, so the Act um, introduced the concept of the body corporate, which is essentially just the, all of the owners. It's a way of managing the complex. Um, the body corporate has various rights and obligations, including it has the obligation to ensure the premises as a whole. Um, there are limited exceptions, uh, such as um, where the units are freestanding, then there's an, there's an ability to for the owners to ensure the property them, or their own unit, um, but, and, the co and the body corporate would then ensure the common areas. But it's pretty unusual for a body corporate to, or units in a body corporate to be freestanding. Um, the contents within the unit can be ensured by the owners themselves, as with the cross-lease situation. So um, some of you will have had an EQC claim for your contents just within the, your own unit, which um, you can deal with independently. Um, the body corporate also, also has an obligation to repair and maintain. So this is the common areas. Any building elements that are, um, ha that are used in common with any unit, so a balcony perhaps. Um, also, any building elements that are shared between the units, that's the roofs, um, the walls, horizontal, um, vertical, um, the foundations, um, they're all, the body corporate has to be the one that's maintaining them. So it means that um, this, coupled with the fact that the MB guidelines treats the building as a whole, means that it's the body corporate as the insured party who takes on the responsibility of, of settling the claim. Um, and it's the body corporate to whom the insurance proceeds are paid. Um, decisions of the body corporate are made by way of resolutions passed by the owners, um, either at a general meeting or a postal vote. E each owner has one vote, or one, each, there may be several owners, but it's, um, they're treated as, as one owner for one unit. 
A poll can be requested at a meeting, in which case each owner's vote is worth um, their unit entitlement, which in our example that John mentioned was 6.6%, so that would be the value of your vote. Um, the strict procedures under the Act um, relating to notice periods and um, time frames for meetings and that sort of thing can make it quite difficult for a claim to be progressed very quickly by a body corporate. And so there is an ability under the Act for the owners to appoint a committee so that decisions like, simple decisions like obtaining an expert report or um, arranging an inspection can be um, bogged down in a, in, in a mire of compliance issues, which you don't, you know, there's enough going on anyway to have to deal with that. So fortunately this can be overcome by the appointment of a committee. Um, uh, the committee can comprise of just a few owners who are um, delegated powers by the body corporate and one of those powers could be to deal with the insurance claim. But our advice would be that, well first our advice is if, you don't, if you're a body corporate and you don't have a committee then you, you need to get one if you're a large body corporate particularly. Um, it, the advantages are that it can speed up your process because the decisions are made very informally, um, no notice of meetings required, decisions are made by majority and could be made by email as long as um, all record of decisions are made are kept in writing as well as minutes of any meetings kept. Um, we also don't suggest that the full power to settle the claim is delegated to the committee. Um, there's a couple of reasons for this. First of most owners, I think I should just, yeah. Um, okay, sorry about that. So um, most owners will want to retain some control of their own, of, of their claim via the, <coughs> excuse me, via the body corporate. And also there's a personal obligation or a personal liability on the committee members to make sure they act in the best interest of, the, of the, all the owners, which is quite a, a large responsibility. Um, one of the requirements for in the appointment should be um, to make sure that the committee is, is reporting regularly, as well as keeping regular meetings, so that you can keep tabs on what they're doing, basically. Um, our experience is that five is a very workable number. It means a majority decision can be made. And ideally you would have the most commercially knowledgeable and experienced owners involved in the, on the committee. So I've mentioned before that there is an obligation or, or a, um, a requirement that the body corporate um, reinstates or repairs the complex. But if an insurer has elected to cash settle, um, there isn't, a, or, or even if it hasn't, um, but, I'm, but where it's going to reinstate, there is no option there. You just have to, you know, you're going to be reinstated. But if the insurer has decided or has said that they will cash settle with the body corporate, um, it can decide by special resolution, which is 75% of the votes, to not to repair or rebuild. Um, but in exercising a vote of that nature, each owner must have all have the prior consent of their mortgagee or bank if they if they have a mortgage. Um, if someone objects to that, so they've, a vote's been passed not to reinstate, there is an ability for um, an owner to object, and they can follow up this with having their objection heard by the district or the high court. If it's, if it's over $200,000 involved, then it's off to the High Court, so it's pretty much generally in a body corporate situation going to be High Court. And the Court has the power to either overturn or confirm the res that resolution. So if reinstatement has been voted against and there's been no objection, then the owners will need to vote on how the settlement monies are distributed. And there are no rules around this, it's whatever the owners believe is the fairest method. Um, it could, for instance, be they decide to do it by unit entitlement. So in our last example where 
um, there was six percent, six point six percent was the um, the the value of the owner's entitlement. If you had a complex worth um, or well, the payout was five million number of units involved, say fifteen units, that would mean that that owner with a six point six percent interest would get about three hundred and thirty thousand. Another way of doing it could be to value the units and um, take into account any likelihood of further, further future damage. Um, but whatever method, it's, it's really for the owners to come to the fairest method that they think suits them best, and 75% of them need to agree to it. So we've, that, that's the situation where you've decided, where you've gone through the process and you're not going to reinstate. But where you are going to reinstate and you've got this cash, um, again, the owners need to come to a 75% or 75% in agreement as to how the cash is going to be, or the insurance funds will be spent. Um, and it's not a power that can be delegated to the, to the committee, although the implementation of the body corporate's um, decision can be delegated to a committee. Um, Say so things like dealing with the project manager, managing the, the, um, the timetable, that sort of thing. Um, there is a further catch-all provision in the Act whereby if any party that's interest has an interest in a unit, that could be the body corporate itself, or the bank, an or an insurer, or the unit owner, uh, is unhappy with any decision made by the body corporate, or a lack of a decision, they can apply to the High Court to, for the High Court to make their own to make the decisions for them essentially. So the, the court has power to to decide that in fact the the, the uh, property will be reinstated, or it may direct how the insurance proceeds are to be spent. So just in summary, um, I think the essential point that's probably come out tonight is that where you own a multi-unit. Um, it, it is imperative that you're working together to, to reach the best solution for all of you. Thank you.